so welcome to another war game review from the playershate.com. My name's Alexander. And I'm Grant. And today we're taking a look at uh, a slightly older game. Uh, this is Baptism by Fire, which is a BCS game from Multiman Publishing. Yeah, you've got me wondering what year it was made. Uh, I want to say it was like five, six years ago, so like yeah, 2016, it should 2017. Say on the yeah, back on the of box. This box, huh? Yeah. 2017. Okay. Because I remember. We were kind of new, and I remember it coming out, and I thought, ooh, that looks cool. Yes. And it was cool. And so uh, this is a two-player Hex Encounter World War II war game. Uh, mm -hmm. Baptism by Fire, brackets, the Battle for Kaz of Kazarines. Battle of Kazarine Pass, uh, which is 1943 in Tunisia, I believe. Happy to be wrong about that. Yeah, it's I, Tunisia's I up there. I think it is. Yep. Um, and it's in February, so we actually <laughs> played this in February. in February. So, uh, if you 2024. Yeah, if you don't know and you're following along currently, in 2024, we are trying to play some of our kind of games that have been sat on the shelf for a while. We came up with a name for it, I forgot what it was. Shelf of Shame Dust Off. Shelf of Shame. And that's thanks to comma, Dust Off. That was courtesy of someone on our YouTube channel, Yes, maybe? It, yes, yeah. it was definitely on YouTube. So, uh we, in an attempt to play some of these games that we bought and have been sat on a shelf for a while, we dedicated to kind of one a month and we tried to kind of tie them in of, of when the actual battles took place. Yeah. So this is February 1943, it's February 2024. Uh, just kind of a, give us an excuse to get tied down into this. Well, it's, it's a thematic way to kind of go through the year and kind of look forward to stuff, right? Yeah. So unfortunately, we have several, like we had two bulge games. Yeah. So we we played one in January, Art N44, and we're going to play Time for Trumpets in December. So one of them will be in So December. that'll be the correct month. And then I think we have like two Normandy games. Yeah, so one will be in June. June, one in, one in July. June. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really cool event because it's getting games off of our shelves that we've bought and clipped and wanted to play. And, yeah, and we picked like... Ones that have uh, good reputations mm -hmm. or come from series of games that we like or yep. are well liked. So mm -hmm. it's also, you know, g we're playing some of those prestige games that maybe we haven't got to yet. Yeah. Well, which I I'm excited for. It's been fun. So this is one of that kind of series. So you're like, well, you're playing a game that isn't brand new, Players 8. Well, that's kind of why. Yeah. So BCS is the Battalion Combat Series. Um, this is Volume 2 in that series. Uh, and it is a, it's from the gamers, uh, who they publish everything through MMP. And this game, as well as the series, is designed by Dean Essig. And I think Carl Fung? He's, no, this is Dean. Other ones. This Carl one has done some Dean. of the newer ones. Yes. Aerocourt, I think, was yes. Carl Fung, right? But um, this game system, so we play BCS Aerocourt. That came Loved out it. a couple of years ago. It is an excellent place to start with BCS. Because it's one map. It's one map. The yeah. hexes are larger. The pieces are yep. a bit larger. As such, the game space is smaller. Mm -hmm. And so you're not necessarily as overwhelmed with all the space and pieces. There's a bit more focus so that you can just learn it and play with it. And the system still shines on a map that's just you know one map, basically. Yeah. Um, because BCS is not like your other war games you're still going to move and you're still going to do combat and you have to consider supply, but how you go about doing those things looks quite different from a lot of your other war games, especially when you get down into the details of things. Well, I, I feel like, and, and I'm trying to remember in, the, in my mind all the full stuff that I have in there, and I, I feel like OCS, this is based on OCS, but it was made specifically to be a little bit simpler, a little bit more playable, and, and I... I can see the similarities for sure. Yes. Particularly with your combat trains and the way supply works. But it, it, it is a little simpler, but there's still a lot of crunch here. Yeah, this, it really, to me... It's not a bad thing. It sits but. right in between. you got, like, OCX, OCS for, like, real crunch OCX, complexity. is that a new system? <laughs> yeah, it is now. <laughs> and then SCS, which is very streamlined and, like, supplies, like, hey, can you see your side of the map? That's really it. <laughs> it's, more, it's a bit more yeah. than that, but yeah. this really sits in the middle. Mm -hmm. You have to have um, pretty uh, significant supply considerations, but the crunch of it on the map is 
much more reduced compared to OCS, where yeah. you're you're really you're counting and lots of pieces and yeah. throwing. Like, the the one thing that I remember from our introductory discussion with Gary about OCS Smolensk was that concept of extenders and yeah. throwing of supply. That that this doesn't have that. It it has those combat trains, but it doesn't go to that level. So that's why I say this is a little more. It's a little yeah. less crunchy, but, but still has some crunch. Yeah, it, uh, but unlike something like SCS, where you are supplying your units across Just to the, the board, side of the map, yeah. This one, you are supplying individual formations, mm -hmm. and th if they do not get supply, they will have their own impacts, and so you have to, you know, you've got five or six different kind of supply routes and considerations you're thinking about. Yep. But it's not as mathematical <laughs> as something sure. like this. So it sits in this middle space really well. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a game of formations, and it is a game of operational space. Yep. This is a very spatial game. And, and keeping those formations together, and they literally use the term crossing the streams. Right? Yeah, so you, you will... It's not Ghostbusters, it's... I mean, it's, but, it's but, supply busters. Yeah, <laughs> but it's crossing the stream in your supply back to that source. Yeah, because you literally mm -hmm. clog the roads with too many trucks. Yep it's going to be harder to get your maximum supply. Yeah. Now, and, and you know, and then you're also worried about your blobs. Uh, blobs is, a, is a, great term. a genuine, great serious term. term in this game, yeah. uh, which basically is just your, your AO, your area of operations for that particular formation. And it's an amorphous kind of blob yeah. of where you are, and you, you have to kind of keep that integrity. And if you do kind of violate yeah, that, if you mix there's, a, those, there's a penalty. There is a penalty, yeah, and, and, and I just... Which I think is cool. Without being like mega punitive, like it's right. annoying, it's not great. Well, you isn't it to activation? It. Isn't it mainly to activation Yeah, so if you, if you on mix the snafu. blobs, you get a command token, and the command gives you a negative one to your snafu the, roll. Is it the coordination The coordination, marker? sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, well, which it, it, I actually really like that because the concept the real focus of the supply in the game is activation. Yes. It, it's it's not necessarily the way we... I think there's still some of the same effects, right? But it it's about... It's very... Yeah, I think it's quite different. It, it is. It's, it's about how and how often you're going to be able to actually do something. Yes. Because you have to do the snafu roll, and you have to... You know, there's three different levels of it. There's full activation, which is a seven or higher out of 2d6. Yep. With a Parse lot of negative modifiers. To you're you're always going to have at least negative <laughs> Seven, one. That's easy. A lot of times negative two has to do with fatigue and how far your streams are crossing. And one of my favorites, and the thing that I struggle the most with this game, and I'm now getting off topic, but still on the same, is going over the track roads versus the major roads. Which is a massive feature of this particular oh, title. And it was so funny because we were setting this up, and I'm trying not to get off the topic, but when we were setting this up, this wall of mountains and the Kazarine Pass, you know, you're sitting here going, oh, this is really cool. It's a, it's a quagmire. It's very difficult for the, particularly the allies, to, to get what they need because there's just trails all over the place. There's only one major road and it's really kind of yeah. to the, I think this is the east, if I'm not mistaken. But, but anyway, that, those concepts affect how much you can do. Yes. Whether you can actually activate, and in the in our game, your first activation roll, yeah, was with my forward German Africa Corps, who are really at the head of this very long traffic jam that yep. has to go through this very narrow pass, and poised to really make some hay that first day. You probably could have captured at least one other yeah. VP hex, and then set myself up for at least another with a follow up with your other formations. Yeah, but you rolled a three. At a negative one, which yeah. puts you down to a two, which meant you don't activate. They, they just really don't do anything meaningful. Yeah. And, and then you can then try to activate them again by somewhat pressing your luck. There is no penalty, though. No, but it's a, it's a die roll to get that second activation. And then be able to roll another snafu roll. And then you roll another, roll another snafu and you might still not get it. And, and it seems like it's a lot of that, but I really enjoy... The way that works together in the concept of this operational yes. model, and, and and the reality is, is this kind of activation system where like 
I, I'm going to pick these guys, I'm going to activate this formation. Then you're going to roll this snafu roll to see how well they activate. Mm -hmm. That's the game. That's the whole game. Yep. Because doing what you need to do, you know, the regular war game stuff. Okay, I'm trying to get the best modifiers possible by combining arms and mm -hmm. attacking at favorable places. We're all doing that in every game. But in this one, it's I. how do I get myself to a position where I am much more favorable on that snafu table. Yeah. I'm going to be favorable if I can get my supply lines in order. Mm -hmm. If I can not have crossing command areas by keeping my blobs separate. But it's very hard not to have oh, yeah. any of those things going but, on. But that's that's where the that's game is. That's where the is. crux of the game is, yeah. And it's such a different focus from, from every other game that it's really enjoyable to play in that space and play around with it. Yeah. Especially in this game. Because of the terrain. Yep. That terrain that you mentioned earlier, it is... I mean, it, it is a wall. And, and like... Literally. This is what they had to do. Yep. And you have to face this. And mm -hmm. it is real ugly. Yep. Uh, when I think about back to Aracourt, where it was like... The terrain was much less of a... I felt like there were lots of good yeah. roads for supply, Agreed. at least. Yep. And the terrain's a bit more combat-focused on this one. Like, i got to drive my guys up here and... I, I, that compresses them all, which means there's knock-on effects for, like, retreats in combat. Because if yeah. you're really compressed, your retreats look very different. Or you might start getting mixing into your commands, and you're going to get those coordination markers. Like, setting yourself up for success is so much about maneuver and space in this game. Well, and, and oh, also and I love it. keeping your headquarters... You, you know, you have to be in command range. Yes. How many times did I get out of command range as the Allies because I was desperately trying to sprint ahead with my puny units that were mostly beat up anyway, just to stop you from walking in to those VP hexes. So that concept is very cool because then you got to think about, okay, I'm not going to be able to activate next round. How am I going to, to stand up? And, and those make some really, I think, interesting decisions for the players. Yeah. And a lot of war games, it, it, there's no static lines in this one, right? No, this really, system really doesn't not. really have that. And that's something typically in bigger war games you will see. You'll see a front that's contiguous, units stacked on units, and here it's a little more maneuvering, a little more friendly open space. But now with this terrain, though, that really it forces you to think. Yep. Yeah, it, it's a game of manipulating your space. Yes, that, within terrain, within supply considerations, within command considerations, and efficiently doing that so that you're yeah. getting in position to continue that. And the, uh, you it's know, great. And then you do some combats. Yep. And the combats have a bunch of modifiers with again all that stuff. It, it, you know, some of it looks different, but you know, you're looking for good combined arms, good units. Yeah. You know, s spearhead units, s good support units, and bringing all that together. That's almost going to take care of itself because you have a lot of that within a formation that you're trying to keep together. Yeah. And but it's a, it's really a game of like command and maneuver and supply and activation. It's it's, it's so very cool. unique. And this map to play that on was very oh, yeah. it was unique. Th very. This cool. was a very different experience. Yeah. And this is only our second BCS game. We, we we've yes. only played Aracourt. We played it not last year, but it was a 2022. Love that game. Yes. Still on your shelf, I yes. think, right here. Yep. And because of that, that sprung board us into, oh, we, we want to get the other. So we bought Baptism by Fire and Brazen Chariots. And I've had Brazen Chariots for ages. And didn't we go on the website tonight and buy... We, I, had, I didn't one? press the button, but we have decided okay. to get at least... I forget which one now. Yom, Yom Kippur? V Kippur? Valley of Tears. Yeah, Valley of Tears. And what was the other one? There, anyway. The, Panzer's Last Stand, I think. Yes. <laughs> but the, there's six of them. And it's just a really good system. I, I have really enjoyed our two experiences with it. Now, by no means did we play a full campaign of this. A a and I think we're in, like, turn eight or nine. Yeah, so we did we did the high watermark scenario. It's yeah. a three-turn scenario. I think the game is a total of ten, scenario, ten, ten turns. Got it. Uh, if you want to do it start to finish. But, but Aracourt, one map. Uh, Baptism by Fire, two maps. Two maps. These these two are the most approachable from a the, size. The smallest, standpoint. yeah. The other ones, Brazen Chariots, is four maps. And, and that's fine, right? Valley that, of Tears, four that, maps. That doesn't necessarily scare me. 
But if you, we will pick a smaller scenario to, to dive into. But if you want to dip your toes, this and Aracorp yep. are two really good, really good ones. Really good places to do that. And, and frankly, I mean, we've played a lot of war games. Yes. This is such a unique and different experience yes. to almost everything else that I, we play. I, I, I couldn't agree more. As much as I love things like the 40X series from GMT and the SES standard combat series, I, I'm really starting to like this system. It's fantastic. It just it just poses so such different problems. Yep. And, and, and you've got to think about your games in a totally different way. Yep. And... Uh, figuring that stuff out is very rewarding in the game oh, yeah. and also just it's just such an interesting thing to play around with instead of yeah so you know like you said we've played a lot of other games where it's like cool i can read the rules i know exactly what i'm doing yeah. this, this one, one was you, still like yeah okay how do i how do i make it happen <laughs> well and, and it's also about you know not only just understanding those mechanics and the terrains and how and the terrain and how supply fits into that but it's how to put that all together yeah. How to make it all work together. And by the end of the second and third turn, we're like, okay, I, I get it now. I remembered now. I, I We're doing it. And now I'm like, well, I really want to play a, a bigger scenario of this. And it also actually makes me really want to play OCS Smolensk. I, I have that game. We bought it because of Buckeye Game Fest a couple of years yeah. ago. But I guess what I would say about BCS is I think this is a fantastic system. Yes, I really, I really do. I, I, I think it's well respected out in the gaming world, but I don't think you hear as much about it as you do, like, say, OCS or yeah, some well, of the others. You know, there's six games in the line. And that's, it's newer. It's nothing to balk at, but it is relative to yeah. some of the other series out there. New. Uh, and, and it's, it's so good. And it's growing in traction. I think the new rules, because I think Aracourt uses... I have to check. It uses a more, uh, they really, it's, yeah, this is 2.0 rules. Okay. Uh, this box has 1.1, I think. Okay. Um, and the, so we should have maybe, I should have maybe downloaded the Well, I know the new one rules. of them, yeah, this is 1.1. 1. 1. 1. But like, they're fine. They work for this. Yeah, they worked. Right. But it, it's, I think that 2.0 set of rules just kind of tidied it up and clarified some things because yeah. Because this is such a paradigm shift, I think a lot of people early on were like bouncing off of it. But yeah. I think as it's they've released more games and people have spent more time with it, it, it yeah. really is. There's something really good in the system. This particular title I really, really enjoyed. I don't know if we've ever played a Kazarine Pass game before. I don't. I don't believe we. And, we played North Africa, but the, but, but mostly that's really, Western Desert. Yeah, typically, this, this is really good. Yeah, this was so. really, really enjoyable. Uh, I, I had a blast with this, and uh, I, I would I would play it again. I would play oh, the no whole doubt. campaign in it. There's little bits about like the secret objectives and stuff like that, where sure. the German player doesn't really know what they're doing going into it. Right. Uh, you kind of set up your stuff, and then you pick one of those two. And like, oh, I guess we're doing this side of the map, or we're doing this yeah. side of the map. What I'll do is I'll kind of show you at least uh, to some degree how the game works. Might be a little bit too complicated for like full rules breakdown, but. Uh, we'll wrap up with a few final thoughts. So here's a look at the map. Um, it's uh, the gamer's map, which is fine. Um, but what we're looking at here mostly is, uh, obviously you have the Kazarim Pass. We have these very large kind of rougher mountain areas. Uh, and then you can see this kind of long traffic line of, uh, of Axis forces coming up here and trying to break out and spread forwards this way. And then we have um, a lot of Americans with some Commonwealth forces here uh, and then some free French as well, uh, trying to kind of basically plug this gap and plug this gap over here. So st strategically, that's kind of what's going on. Um, there's a couple of cool different objectives in this one where there's this big center section of the board that you score points from, but you might have to go left flank or right flank on top of that as well. And you don't know until you kind of set it all up, which is interesting. But um, generally speaking, we've got ourselves uh, a bunch of different formations. And I think that would be my only beef with this particular one, is that everything here is done by formation activation, but the formation at the formations are delineated most of the time 
simply by a name on a counter. So, for example, we have uh, the Reimkampfgruppe, but you you have to where it says rhyme on here, rhyme on here, rhyme on here, like that's this is the little Kampfgruppe, but that, that's harder to see at a glance. So just know that this is a little bit of a detailed concentration game when you're playing it. Like you know where you put your guys, but sometimes when they all look the same color, well, really this is also. This is Kampfgruppe Gerhard as well, and Reim. And then when Lang was here, it was like three, they're all the same color. They don't have colors to delineate between the different Kampfgruppers, which is just, you know, it's okay, but I wish they had like a formation bar on them. Um, so you could, at least for the main ones, um, see that at a glance. Makes it easier without trying to mix them. But Generally speaking, this is a game of I'm going to choose to activate one of my formations and then you are going to roll uh, on your snafu table here. This is the crux of the game right here. Um, you're going to roll 2d6 and you're trying to roll a 7 or more and that'll give you a full activation. If you roll less than that, you'll get a partial activation and if you're a real bad, you're going to get no activation. And that is basically a, a big conglomeration of command and control, of supply, uh, and, and general initiative. So if you are all mixed up, like if your formation is literally mixed up with another one, uh, where they're crossing over their AOs, you're going to take a penalty on that roll. Um, if your combat trains, which are the fancy pants words for their, like, supply lines. If your supply lines mix with another formation's supply lines, you're going to take a penalty to that. Because, you know, it's not as efficient getting all the kind of trucks and supplies there. If your supply lines are on their ghost mode, you're going to take another penalty for that. <laughs> because they, they go on their ghost mode. I don't know why it's called ghost mode. I don't, I don't know the reason behind that. But basically that's if they have moved or been disrupted in some way, there's a further penalty to that. Um, you also get a penalty for fatigue. Um, so you're going to look at your formation leader, and he has a fatigue rating of a zero. So you'll take a zero point penalty to that. That's fine, but on this one, oh, it's a zero as well. Great. Of course, I don't have any. Great. I know that Dak has a bunch. So Dak has two. He's going to take a two penalty uh, on that as well. So... The more stuff you do, you know, you have you can do a bunch of stuff and then you've got to kind of chill out for a little bit, remove some of that fatigue, take a break, and then you go again, right? It's that cycle of activation and, and movement that we see in a lot of combat games. Uh, but all of those things are going to be penalties to your snafu roll. So, you know, if you're nice and fresh and everything's organized, great. And if it's not, real bad. Because if you have a, a fail activation, you basically can't do anything. If you have a partial, you're going to be half movement, and it's like slow and kind of gross. If you get a full activation, wonderful. You can place a couple of objective markers, which means, you know, you can move forward. You can actually engage in combats. Uh, you'll get bonuses on those combats because you have planned it well and executed it with some level of coordination. Um, you might have the opportunity to make prepared defenses, uh, depending on what you want to do. All sorts of good things when you ha get a full activation. But what that tells you is, is that this snafu table and this activation roll is the most important part of the game. Uh, and as such, you're going you're gonna to treat it that way. You're going to play this game around that snafu roll. Because combat, we'll go through combat here, it's some modifiers and you roll 2d6 and look up the results on a chart. Fine. But the crux of the game is, can I do more full activations and more effective full activations than my opponent? Can I disrupt his supply lines? Can I make him have to mess up his AOs so that they are less effective? It's about causing chaos in this game more than it is by causing losses. Um, and I say that because, you know, you look at these little uh, Falschim Eagers. This yellow six at the top, they've got six steps. Um, inflicting steps, losses, is a very long and arduous process. You're very rarely going to eliminate units in this particular game. You'll, you'll eliminate some, but you, you're going to 
mess with an enemy by making them disorganized and useless and then effectively forcing them to retreat and seed ground more than um, eliminating units at this scale. So when you activate, you're going to go through kind of this list of modifiers and it's, you know, all to do with do you have coordination markers for crossing AOs? How much fatigue do you have? Is, are you a mixed formation, which the, the game will tell you if it is or not? Um, Game-specific snafu DRMs, some games, you're just like, hey, these guys suck, so they have a penalty to that. Or a modify, because they're really good. Um, where your elite combat trains are placed, which we talked about as your supply lines, it's very, very important about where you place those. Um, and then you're going to kind of roll your 2d6 and get, you, get your result. Once you get your result, you've got your four or five units within that formation, and you're going to move them as per usual. Now, uh, let's take a look at a, a motorized infantry unit right here. Uh, so, uh, this is from Kampfgruppe Reim. Uh, and look at, the, look at the symbols at the bottom of this counter. It's a very different counter from what you're used to seeing. So this number, the 12, in the bottom right-hand corner, that is the movement factors. Then uh, this little arrow simply means that this particular unit is assault capable. And what that means is, is that um, they are capable of leading a, a kind of a regular planned attack. Units that do not have this arrow cannot lead an attack. They can support attacks, but they can't lead them. Why that's important is because a lot of your armor units do not have that assault arrow on them. Uh, and so you're not spearheading with tanks typically in the same way. Um, your tanks can move and fight engagements. They're going to spearhead that way, uh, but that's armor on armor combat and that looks very different. Now, but your kind of regular attacks with combined arms, typically you're going to lead with an infantry style unit. They have this little superscript three in the bottom, in the middle. That is the, ta oh gosh, what do they call it? Uh, I know we've said it a hundred different ways. Uh, it's the, oh gosh, it's the attack rating. I don't think that's what it's called, but it might be the action rating. It might be the attack rating. This is basically their quality. This is going to be a modifier to your dice roll. The bigger that number is, the better the unit is. Uh, so three is very average. Um, you can get fours, fives, sixes. You'll have ones and twos for little crampy green units. Uh, then we also have that yellow six that we mentioned at the top. That is the steps. Now, if we flip this over, you'll notice there's six. There's still six steps. Steps are tracked by these. Um, numerical markers underneath. You'll see a lot of those. There's a lot in the game. Uh, so what is this reverse side of the counter? Well, if you look at the numbers on this, this is the movement rating is way down from a 12 to a 4, and it's a different color, which we'll talk about here in a second. But the that attack rating in the middle went up. They got better. So in this game, you have this, this is a movement side, right? Think about it, it's a motorized infantry. All the troops are in the trucks, and so they have this black, very high movement rating. A black movement rating is truck movement. It means they're really good on roads. This reverse side, they're deployed. So all the troops got out of the trucks, and they are literally in their foxholes and trenches and in their positions. They now have a white movement factor. White movement factor is leg movement. Leg movement is obviously much slower, however, they can traverse much more difficult terrain than you can with truck movement. And because they're out and they're deployed and they're ready, their attack, their attack rating went from a 3 to a 4, which is much better, honestly. It makes a big difference. So that's, this game is very different from a lot of other games with that move and attack side. Uh, and when you're doing these moves and attacks, I can't remember where I picked them up from, um, you're, you're going to before you activate, you can choose to flip them to either side, then you perform your actions. What you cannot do is you cannot drive 12 spaces and then flip over to your deployed side. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of a cadence to how, and how you flow doing that kind of thing. Uh, but that's very important because when you look at the terrain effects chart, so to go in an open, it literally costs a truck two movement points per open space. But... Um, on, a, on a road, it's one quarter. So trucks are really good on the roads with that sweet, sweet, nice suspension. 
uh, but when they get off road, not good. Conversely, uh, leg units are, uh, you know, they're, they're good, they're better in the open, but they're much slower walking on the roads, right? And leg movement, you typically won't get those high factors of 12, it's a four. So I can move eight spaces. But with this, a truck on a quarter on secondary roads could move 48 spaces. So that's, that's really the difference. Then you start getting into like prohibited terrains. Trucks just can't go in rough uh, or mountain, which is all of this brown stuff. The trucks just cannot go in there. Uh, and like to walk on a mountain costs all of a leg movement point. Then we have this tack movement in the middle, which is kind of somewhere in between. Tack movement is this red factor. It's mechanized, it's armor units, uh, things with tracks, think about it that way. Uh, and they kind of sit somewhere in the middle. We have to be very careful about how and what you move uh, and what your movement allowances allow uh, for the same reason that, you know, if, if you can't advance after combat, you can't attack into areas that you can't move into, you have to be very careful about that kind of thing with what side your counter is on when you're launching attacks and things like that. Uh, to perform an attack, uh, you're going to look at a set of factors which are listed on the... Uh, modifiers table here and again it's very interesting so you have this dual or supported so a dual unit uh, we have a couple on the board let me fish one out here now that I've said that I won't be able to find it but I know we have okay here's a good one uh, so this unit from the American Combat Command A so a dual unit, if you look at this left-hand side, they have the assault arrow and they have the red AV-2, which is armor value that's there, literally there, and, you know, it's the guns, anti-tank, right? Because this is a, this is, um, this is a, an armor unit, right? And so it has both, so you get a combat modifier for that because you're both mobile and you have good attack power. Where it's, so they can lead an assault because um, they're mechanized infantry, but they can't, um, uh, but you know, they're not quite as good. So that, for example, this guy has a three, he's got this really nice beefy attack factor for armor, but he doesn't have the arrow, he can't lead an assault. Uh, but th you know, these mech, inf these mech units, they're, they're, they can be independent. They're usually a little bit weak on both ends, but you, you know, you get, you sacrifice the values to get the modifier, right? Uh, if you're the attacker, you might do a suppression mission. Each of your HQs has a, has a little inherent, oops, artillery value on them. You, you can spend that to either roll on a barrage table, which, you know, mix bag and you might totally biff it, or you can just spend it, not roll on that table, and just pick up a modifier for combat, which honestly is kind of, that's what I do. I, I felt like that was more effective. I don't roll well though, so that's me. Um, you get a bonus for assisting. Uh, assisting is literally having a second attacking unit in that same hex or an adjacent hex. Um, very, very typical standard stuff. However, you also have to be careful because we have this, uh, this kind of unit capabilities chart and we have this assist column. A lot of combat units can assist but not necessarily all of them. Um, so if you have a red AV support, they cannot assist in an attack. Uh, a red AV support, gosh, do I have any on the board that we can take a look at? I'm pretty sure I do, but I don't know quite where they are. Let's have a quick gander. Um, we're gonna make a big old mess of this whilst I'm doing this. Do we have them in combat card A? No. Well, um, a lot of those, they are literal counters that say the word support on them, and they will have a red attack value, but they're, and typically those are um, like anti-tank guns. It's very hard to attack with a pack 48 or a pack 40, right? That, that's a defensive weapon. And so those can't assist in an attack. But so you just got to be careful that your units that you have can assist. That's basically all that is. Double objective zone. When you get a full activation, they give you two of these objective markers um, and you can only attack in the areas this 
and then a, and a two hex radius, you can attack anyone in that space. Uh, so you could do like here and here and then attack at two different areas. Or if you double stack these and both point them at the same hex, that's, you know, we're going really hard on that area. You can get a, a bonus modifier for that. But you can only get this if you have one of those sweet, sweet um, full activations. So again, the activations is really, really important. Uh, and if you're attacking into a, uh, if you have a prepared defense, then you take a penalty on attack because you're really like playing defensively. You have to jump out of your heavy fortifications. You're not as well prepared for the offense because you've been defensively preparing. All, all that kind of stuff. Um, shock attack only. There's, there's shock type attacks that you can do that you can get some modifiers from. Then you go to defenders and the defender's going to have prepared defenses, multiple defenders in a hex, hex side terrain, um, easy to terrain hex, uh, specifically infantry in a, in a terrain hex or a dual, AV in a terrain hex doesn't make a blind bit of difference, which I think is really interesting, um, because red AV get a bonus in an open hex. So think about that. Tanks are better out in the open. Um, the tanks are less mobile, um, if they're stuck behind stuff, right? They effectively become a gun at that point. So what you're going to do is you're going to add your tactical ratings, which was that little center number. So you're going to add your three to all of whatever modifiers apply, and you're going to compare that to your to the defender, and say the defender's got his little two and all of his defensive modifiers, and the difference between those two is the overall modifier. So then we're going to roll 2d6, and I rolled a five, six, seven, eight, plus, let's say we had a plus two from all that net modifying. Great. Then you're going to look that up on your CRT. Here's my little CRT, not a big one. And you're going to apply these results. And I will tell you, a lot of these results are attackers taking damage, and a few of them are defenders retreating, and some of them have like situational retreats. What that means is, is that it is incumbent upon you um, to make those attacks count and maneuver and positioning and getting the right assets into play is the most important part of this game. And that, again, once again, rolls back to um, your activations, your positioning, your movement. To set yourself up is really important, but you have to have your supply for that. You've got to make sure that you're not literally crossing the streams is what that's called, wonderful. Um, all that stuff. So it is a detailed game. Um, it's it's complex, but only in a way where it's very different. Like this game is no more complex than something like um, Holland 44, but because it's a very different type of game, like the rules are not rules that you see in other games. I think it feels more complex, but really it isn't. It's a similar level of complexity, but the paradigm shift is what kind of trips people up. But that is kind of a brief look at the game. Uh, what we'll do is we'll wrap up with a few final thoughts. So that was a look at the, at the map and, and uh, how some of it functions at least. Um, I had a wonderful time playing. I, I did too. That, that's I, for sure. I would continue to play tonight. I know we've got another thing we got to do, but... This is one I would love to revisit, and I cannot wait to play Brazen Chariots. Bigger game. Yes. Three or four maps, you said, it's, right? It's four, four maps, but it's western desert, so it's that right. little so it's, row, and, it's, and you're still just fighting along those A lot of lines. open space, right? <laughs> just, But I, I, I really enjoyed this. The other thing, we didn't talk much about it. You probably did in the, you did in the rules kind of discussion, but the combat in this one's also very, very crunchy. It's very unique and interesting. Yes. It's not just... Rolling on a CRT, you, you're comparing. What, what do they call it? Your net combat value. Yeah, uh, they is? have. A, I net call it modifier. I call equals it a net tactical. attacker. Is that attack rating? Attack rating. Yeah. So each unit has an, an attack rating that's a, that's printed on it. You add that as your base. Action rating. Action rating. You add that as your base. Then you add any number of modifiers from artillery. You know, I, th I think the Allies had a lot more artillery than the Germans uh, in this one, right? Bit of a bit of a mixed bag. Oh, you never the, got those up into no, it. No, and the Italians only had one. They, they saw. Okay. But, you know, you add that in, and then based on the type of units, there are red support units that will give you an extra, and they even give you these really great little markers to, yeah. to mark those because you've got stacks, 
and having that on there or having those cool counter sled card yeah, things. Yeah, there's some cool third really party counter sled cards that we're looking at Did, getting. Didn't we like put it in our basket and we're gonna yeah, buy those yeah. afterwards? But you know, you add all those modifiers up, so it's it's similar to other CRTs, and then you roll two uh, two D six, you add that. Yeah, it, the differential between those two big numbers. And it's it, it's just very different, but it, it makes sense based on the the way the game is laid out and actually works, I think, pretty well. well. And, and, and like, you want to roll high. And like any good combat system, after you've done four or five combats... It, it's down. Uh, yeah, I knew most of the modifiers that I was looking for. Yep. If I'm the attacker, I'm looking for this, that, and this. If I'm the defender, I'm looking for this, yeah. that, and this. Because I know There's a lot of modifiers. Yeah, but like half of them, you're like, this is not applicable, or right. things like defending in a terrain hex. You don't look at different types of terrain. Yeah. Is it a terrain hex, yes or no? Yeah. Y that's very different to me. Yep, it, it, it is. You're right. That, yeah, it's terrain hex or city hex. That, And it's very different. And the other thing, it's cool. I think they simplified it by just saying, like, hex side, right? And Yeah, is, it, and is there hex side a, terrain? Yes yeah, no. are you attacking across a river or an escarpment or any number of things? But I think the combat system, as crunchy and interesting and a little not overdone, but the supply is... Combat, I think, is actually pretty straightforward. Yeah. I feel like it's much more straightforward than I thought it would be. And I think that's that a sense. very, very purposeful design choice by Dean. Sure. It's where it's like we're keeping the focus on the things that we want to focus on, which is activation, supply, command, yep. and and the kind and of, then let's make combat uh, fairly straightforward. Yeah, it's yeah. You st still there's crunchy. still all those considerations. Yep. yep. But it is a formation has four units in it. Yeah. There's only so much you can do with that with combined arms and moving guys around. Yeah. You're going to have two stacks of two units each in this yep, one. It, it's, <laughs> like, yep. And that's it. Now, now, I will say this. The counter clutter, I think, can get pretty a, a lot, right? You have you have your fatigue markers for yes. your headquarters. You have your loss markers for your units. Yes. Um, what other markers? You know, you there? might... Like the support unit that I you mentioned. You might be sat on a minefield yep. breach. You might also have support Extra markers. artillery. So it can get a bit unwieldy, yep. but that's why, and I don't exactly remember that Prepared name. Prepared defense. We're going to look into getting some third-party counter slates sure. for when you get like one for each formation. We can keep some of that off map. Which yeah. Any game that can accommodate that, I think, is a huge boon to reduce... That stacking limit's two, but like yeah. if you've got two in an HQ and they've all got a bunch of markers, it can it look can, a bit yeah. silly. I mean, it's kind of funny. Some of those stacks are like three and four counter sign. You're like, he's overstacked because you're not supposed to inspect stacks. Yeah, yeah, which a... is cool. But it, no, he's not overstacked. He's just got a prepared defense under there, and he's got a loss here, and I, it, it's just really well done. I think the the way it works together, I thought was just really kind of beautiful. For yeah, lack of a better I, I just word. I really like this system. Yeah. Like there's a lot of counters, but actual units on the board, it's not like there's like no. ten billion units on nope. the board. Like combat units is really not that many comparatively. Well, I think it's I'll show you the counter tray, but I clipped this, but I would say sixty percent of the counter tray is your administrative counters. Yes. There were only about eight wells of two, four, six, eight. Of and units. They are very generous with the administrative counters. They are. You will not. You'll use never all use of those. those. But in something like um, in, in the in the other larger games where you do have a lot more units, you will use that many. Yeah. But, uh, well, then maybe you could transfer some of these over. Yeah. I, my only complaint, and I think this was a complaint that we shared. Yes. I feel like the player aid just needs to be reworked. It needs to be more. So, yeah. this is the play aid. This play aid, honestly, is fine. Yeah, but, but it needs to have this to play. As, a, as, as a bifold, and it needs to have the terrain effects chart, which is only black and yeah. white on the back of this rules. So here's, here's your other page. Make yep. this a bifold. Make this yeah. color with the terrain key that's only printed on the map. Now we've got a good play. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. We were... Because this is silly. Sharing this is crazy. This sharing is this one is crazy. Um, and you could print those off. You could scan these. But you like, can. Let's make that. Let's make that. And the problem yeah. kind of goes away at that point. I, I actually thought a lot of times they have some nice notes here that really... A lot of times it's th these player aids, you really have to go back to the rule book until yes. you've got it down. They, they do a decent job yeah. of explaining rules on the play aid, which I do like a lot. And, and I like the use of the color because that really, yeah. I, I thought, just made it more playable. 
Um, on first, the other comment I would have on first blush, I thought the map looked terrible. Sure, it's this is a classic the gamers map. But I think after I've played it now, I'm like, oh yeah, that that's really it's pretty well done. It does what it's supposed to yep. do. It's it does what it's supposed to functional. do. It it shows the imposingness of these. Is that even a word? Imposingness? No. It is not. now. It is now. TM. Um, but it shows the nature, imposing nature of those mountains really well and and forces. I mean, <laughs> that's why the battles were here. Yeah, I think about the discussions we were having of like, because only leg units can move into mountain spaces, not on roads. And they it uses all their movement points to move one, one spot. So one, two, three, four, five, and, that'd be six and, turns, and the, game's over. And the mountains are so wide that yeah. they would immediately be out of command range. Yeah. You were just having a laugh about like, there's no way yeah. around this. You have yeah. to do the Kazari yep. pass. And I just, it's, it was really fun like yeah. seeing that and just playing around like, oh, what if we went around? You cannot. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> well, and the other thing I thought was really well done with the board was the way the roads are interspersed I'm sure this is historically close, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm sure there were also some liberties taken with certain areas because they really felt purposeful, if that makes sense. And I actually kind of like that. I enjoy maps, like we played a Bulge game a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Had a lot of double backs. There is nothing like a classic double back where you're counting like a... One, <laughs> two, yeah, it's just... <laughs> and you moved, you really moved one yeah. hex, but, but, but it cost you five hex. But there is some of that in here. Yeah. And, and, and I like it because it shows the imposing nature of the, of the mountains. But after playing it, I, I, I didn't have those concerns after playing it. And, that, and that's kind of odd. Maybe yeah. I felt an affinity for the mechanics and didn't care so much about that, but... Yeah, it's a great game. No one, really is. No one plays the gamers' games for how they look. Let's be honest with how ourselves. How dare you, sir? How dare you? They are supremely functional. They are functional. So that you focus on the game and you're not like, ooh, it's the Mona Lisa. But I want to look at something and be yeah. blown away. If it could be, great. But the, sure. the, 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 the game functional. stands on its own legs as yeah, well. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. So, Baptism by Fire from MMP. Uh, honestly, check this out. Can, can I say one more thing? Because I'm a stickler for the graphic design elements. Sure. So what is the tagline underneath the, the Battle of Kazarine, February 1943, yeah. right? That's kind of the official subtitle. So, <laughs> so if you go over here to the board, here's what it reads. <laughs> I hadn't seen that. Oh, no. I, and I noticed this when we were setting up. It uh, says, I hate Baptism this. by Fire, The Bloody Beginning, Kazarine 1943. Now... That might refer to map A, but I don't see any other title on these other maps. No, that's Do full, you? That one's folded in half. So, the title... so I feel like this was like a, an original, early version yeah. of the subtitle. I, anyway, that, that's the graphic concept of, I want it to be consistent. But that, that's not, don't, don't worry so much. <gasps> this but, is wrong. Oh, no. Baptism by five, the bloody beginning, Kazari Nights. This is in the right rules, there, man. Right here and right there. Two to one. Anyway. That's a that's an interesting thing, but <laughs> I noticed that kind that's of crap. Funny. Why do I, I notice I that seen crap? That. I don't know. Uh, anyway, other than <laughs> that one little error, error is a great game. Yeah, I would put this in like my top twenty-five war games. Yeah, if you've not played a BCS, this could be a very good yes. place to start. This or Arrow Court, yep, it's up to either you. Either one of those. But this one works really well, and it's and it's also a topic that I think a lot of people haven't played a game on. Well, I always want to play something that's different, yeah. right? We've played a lot of North Africa games. This is a different North Africa game. Yes. And I'm glad to see that. I really am. Yes. Very cool. I loved it. Yes. Can't wait to play Brazen Chariots. Can't wait to get the other ones that we're looking at ordering. Yeah. We're nuts. So now yeah. SCS, BCS. Eventually, one day, we're going to get into OCS, I promise. Yes. I, I know we're going to. We will to. get the... Well, yeah. Because we, we have Smolensk. Do you have another one? I don't. I, we talked okay. about this. I don't believe I do. No. I have. Um, I have the little small one. The this little thing. small one. Yeah. What is it called? Reluctant enemies. Oh, is that OCS? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But it's apparently it's like. You don't get the OCSness out of it. Okay. So it's, it's a little bit different. But then, you know, that's another game I wanted was Crimea. 
I just, uh, we ultimately held off because we had so yes. many games already that year, and that didn't come out to like October, November, well, something like uh, that. Uh, uh, and we also have the operational matters OCS Sicily 2 on <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so and we will do one one day yeah. where it's like we can well, get it big and on a channel and do it. Shelf of Shame Dust Off Part 2 next year will potentially, potentially if, include some of If we don't get some of a new yeah. one on the table before then. I've got more games at home that I can <laughs> clip and play. Anyway, thanks for playing this. I yeah, this I, is I, it's I loved it. just absolutely loved it. It's such a cool and refreshing and very different system. Yeah, you will get something out of this. Not not a particularly easy rules learn, but not because they're complex, just because it is so different. different. It is and there is different. a number of videos out there that are very helpful about walking you through that as well. There's some people who are big fans of this have dedicated some good time to do that. So have a little look on YouTube and you'll find some good um, guides. Yeah, there's there a lot of good stuff. stuff out there. One other comment I would have is, I, I actually am very proud of us. Like we have really come a long way because I, I think our first couple of years we were very stuck on GMT. Sure. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I feel like we have really broadened out. And, and I think we also pride ourselves on doing small publishers as well. Yes. So we have a lot of stuff on our channel that is small publisher stuff. And that's great. But I'm so glad that we got over some of our early dissatisfaction with the look and feel of some of these systems and just have jumped in. And Well, I, yeah. Sometimes you're like, the price is pretty high. Yeah. But MMP prints and makes their games in the US. So like you are paying little, for you're like, paying, yeah. not slave labor. Uh, yeah. And you are getting a, a product that is typically, especially through the gamers, Dean Essex, kind of a genius. And, uh, and, and those are really well play tested in those groups and you're getting something that's great. Yeah. Like I don't know if I've played a game that was especially part of SES or BCS that like wasn't good. Yeah, they've all been pretty good. Like we've we've played a, a good... I think we've liked others better, but than others, right? Some volumes are better than others. Sure, but, but they're I, all good. I still think about you know SES different series, but I think about Rostov, and I'm like, that oh, game such was a good game. And that was our first SES game, and it was like it's incredible. And it has opened the floodgates to all of these other systems. Yes, it really very dangerous. Has. Uh, yeah, so. I don't even know if you can get that anymore. I think it's out of no, print. I think it's on like second printing order. Is it okay? Pre-order. If you should get that too. Yeah, it's really good. Rostov's so good. Anyway, Baptism by Fire from MMP. Wonderful game. Really enjoyed it. Check yes. this out. If you want to play a BCS game, this is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. If you're a BCS fan and you haven't done this one, you're going to enjoy this too. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I've been Alexander for PlayersAid.com. And I'm Grant.